1991, computer scientist David Gellinter coined the term top site to describe the ability to see a system in its entirety. And this has always been the goal of military strategists, economists, naturalists, biologists, whoever. Um, but the possibility of top site becomes increasingly present with the advent of searchable databases, ubiquitous sensor networks, uh, and high-speed communications. Um, what may not have been so clear in 1991 is that all these tools would very quickly become a whole lot more available uh, with the advent of uh, cheap computers, internet connectivity, uh, etc. You're suddenly using these really previously rarefied tools to find the nearest Starbucks um, and also to peer over the fence of, uh, say, a secret military facility from the once extremely privileged vantage point of an orbiting satellite. So this title, squatting, it should be squatting on the ultimate high ground, I suppose, is, it refers to the, this appropriation of this vantage point. It was once restricted to the state or churches or very large corporations. Um, the term high ground, in a sense, refers to the military strategy of taking uh, the highest lands in order to maintain control of a battlefield, as well as the subsequent strategic uses uh, for surveillance and communication. Um, with the advent of aircraft and ultimately satellites in space, the ultimate high ground, uh, what Lizzie was describing as the God's eye view, I could have called it squatting on God's eye, but I didn't. <laughs> um, it, it describes the, the most privileged of all the vantage points, the one which places the viewer seemingly outside of the action uh, and able to see over every fence and every border. Now, it's my impression that something has changed in the relationship between mapping and authority in relatively recent history. Some kind of trickle-down effect of affordable computing, accessible satellite imaging, and the ability to share local experience with a global audience is influencing the relationship uh, between the map territory, map makers, audience. Uh, to what end, I'm not sure. Um, and hopefully, maybe we can get closer to that issue uh, uh, as we have this conversation. Um, so first up, we've got Pablo Garcia, the uh, founder and principal of Point, a Pittsburgh multidisciplinary research and design studio dedicated to experiments in the spatial arts uh, in a variety of scales from the portable to the urban. Uh, from 2004 to 2007, Garcia worked as an architect and designer uh, for Diller, Scofidio, and Renfro. Uh, currently, he is the Lucian <coughs> and the cast chair in architecture and assistant professor here at CNU. Pablo Garcia. Thanks, Rich. Um, <coughs> so, uh, it's, it's a strange distinction to be among Lizzie and Trevor, kind of cartographers, geographers, extraordinaire. I, I am an architect and, and kind of a cartographer uh, hobbyist, as it were. Uh, but I come at it from a point of view that is more kind of common to architecture, which is the representation question. And not so much the kind of geopolitical question, but more the kind of spatial question. As, as Lizzie mentioned earlier, there's this fundamental problem where you have to take a three-dimensional thing and make a two-dimensional one. It seems like a simple enough thing, but um, there's a long history of that method, which map makers call projection, and we use, loosely use that term for other representational modes. Um, and so my interest in, in mapping kind of is summed up um, with an image uh, like this. So this is, um, I think the lights can come down for that. Um, so essentially, you know, I'm going to have like basically 10 minutes to run through a, <laughs> the entire history of uh, spatial representation, so I'll, I'm going to make big leaps and bounds here. But uh, what fascinates me about this map, this is a satellite image. Um, so all the data on the map is taken from actual visual satellites, um, uh, as Rich mentioned, kind of the top site data, but then projected as though it were uh, a Mercator map. Um, and I think what's interesting about it to me is that it, it fulfills these kind of two basic paradigms. Um, of representation that, that I study very closely in a variety of disciplines. Um, and it's, it's split between the kind of visual, right? So there's the actual photograph, there's the kind of understanding that there's something very real that you're capturing and, and, and something that you actually see. Um, and I, what I call the supra-visual, 
So there are your two distinctions. Uh, this kind of virtual depiction of something that gives you a different view. Um, and in top side, it's kind of about this higher ground to be able to literally see, but in representation, it's more of this kind of virtual construction. Um, and this is virtual going back thousands of years, so being able to draw, let's say, a plan of a building or cutting through a human body to see um, x-ray imagery, these are all kind of supra-visual um, techniques. So you're actually seeing something you can't normally see, but it's a kind of vision. Uh, and so what I want to do is kind of uh, talk a little bit about the tension between vision and supra-vision. Um, and you won't find that word anywhere. I kind of made that word up. But um, it's something that has become increasingly uh, important, especially in the kind of uh, digital age that we're in. So what I want to do is kind of just point out three historical chronological moments where the tension between vision and supervision become really clear. And I think that the history of cartography has a lot of that attention in it. So um, first, I, I kind of want to start with what I call kind of our early shadows. Uh, so if, if, you, if you go back to the ancient days of Greece, uh, this is a photo I took at the base of the Great Pyramids of Giza. Um, there's this fundamental problem where there are some things you just can't measure and you can't understand. Uh, but there are some things that are kind of right in front of you visually available to you to actually turn it into some data. So Thales uh, of Miletus, um, a uh, 6th century BC uh, philosopher, uh, of course philosophers of the time were also scientists, uh, measured the Great Pyramids using a very simple method by, by understanding that the shadow cast by the, the pyramid also has a similar triangle in a kind of stick that he would put somewhere else. He could actually measure the shadow using similar triangles, um, thus kind of making this first super visual moment where you can understand the totality of this enormous structure without actually having to measure it. Um, his student, an examander, um, was, has a distinction of doing two really important things that are kind of visual, super visual. Uh, one is he introduced the gnomon, um, which is the thing that casts a shadow in the sun, uh, to Greece. Uh, and and he, he drew what is considered like the first world map. And so you already saw the Mapa Mundi, or sometimes called a TNO map, um, that Lizzie showed. This is an Anders version here in kind of a German uh, reprint, a more contemporary. Uh, and he, his first map tries to kind of say, well, let's, let's step back and see if we can see the whole world. Um, and beyond that, he also described, um, because of the shadow, he described this kind of global view, even beyond the map of the Earth, but actually into the, the heavens, um, describing, incorrectly, of course, stars, moon, and sun, and outer rings, but noticing that the sun has a variation in summer and winter. Um, there's the kind of summer version, and then the, the winter version, where the sun has moved into a different um, orbit. To him. Uh, a few centuries later, Eratosthenes uh, measured the Earth. Um, this is the 3rd century BC. Essentially, Eratosthenes said, well, I know that in a vertical pit on the equator, there's this town called Syene on, on, on the equator, um, there's a, this well, and the sun comes right in and casts no shadow on the summer solstice. At the same time, a notable distance away, there's, there's an obelisk in Alexandria that casts a shadow of a certain dimension. So he basically took a measurement of the deviation between the shadow of wall of the obelisk and the lack of shadow in the, in the pit, and came up with a, a, a basically a, a degree angle and added it all up. Um, he had less than 1% error. Um, so he was pretty much dead on. If only he knew that the Earth was in fact a prolate spheroid and not a true sphere, um, he probably would have been closer. But uh, there is a person in the 3rd century BC figuring out the size of the Earth based on shadows. Now, years later, uh, Ptolemy, uh, not to be confused with the um, pharaohs, but Ptolemaeus uh, Claudius uh, made what is considered the first map projection. And what's interesting about his map projection is that he, in the Geographia, describes his techniques that he absorbs from an examander and others, uh, and he describes two methods to project a map. Now, this is not from him, this is from the Renaissance version, just depicting his description. <coughs> On the left is a kind of, what he calls a kind of central projection of view map, um, what we might call perspective. Uh, and on the right, a kind of orthographic or a kind of straight parallel line, which he said, this is an easier version. So the one on the right is kind of this easier version for the average person to do on the left. It's a little more complicated, but he basically makes these two projections. And art historians like John White and Sam Edgerton kind of conjecture based on evidence that in the Renaissance, they found the Geographia in Egypt in, a, in an Arabic translation of a Greek version of a Latin version. Um, 
that perspective, in fact, emerged in the Renaissance due to the kind of understanding of the projection systems that um, that Ptolemy laid out based on his forefathers. So that's the first kind of set of, of information, like where kind of these early map projections come from. Uh, now, there's this kind of weird moment in time where that became this weird super visual, visual moment where you're stepping back, you're seeing the map of the Earth, no big deal. Uh, and I want to zoom forward to the year 1599. Uh, up to that point, and, and Lizzie already stole some of my uh, juice on this one, but this is a portal, portal chart. Um, and as she mentioned, you're seeing the outlines and the descriptions of particular ports. Uh, so what you're seeing here is the text is not just the name of the port, but also a quick description of what the port looks like and what is happening in that piece of uh, land as it meets the water. Uh, and so what, what happens with this, and, and this is from the 1300s, um, here's one from the 1500s, um, and then another one from 1489. Uh, what you get when you zoom in is this description map, right? So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a super visual map meaning it's projected, flat, uh, but it's also visual because it has not only descriptions of things like, you know, small inlet or craggy rocks, etc., but also has these kinds of pictorial depictions of what you would see if you were here looking out there. So you can use these things as markers. So there's this kind of blend of the visual and super visual kind of one map, um, even to things like this castle, which is flattened out in two separate elevations. So as you come across the river, you would see this thing on either side, etc., but the kind of flattening, this confusion between the multiple visual perspectives in one flat map, this is kind of a unique way of, of kind of combining the two issues. And then, of course, um, for better or for worse, uh, Gerardus Mercator in 1569 publishes his projection. Uh, it, it is this kind of standard that we all have today, but the reason it's so critical is because it's a cylindrical, cylindrical projection. And the cylindrical projection means that <coughs> the distortions that, that Lizzie talks about uh, are kind of an artifact of a different need. And that is that all the, the lines, the latitudes, longitudes, or the rum lines, or lots of drums, are all straight, right? This is kind of the first map to really say it's all straight, which means that if you are uh, on a ship and you want to go east, you can head east along the line and you know what's on there. So the distortions are a result of kind of nautical navigation desire. But the thing that, that Mercator did was he publishes this map that doesn't tell you how to do it. He just says, here's my map, buy it. And this caused a big problem because obviously it was a useful thing and became kind of a state secret. Uh, and then in 1599, um, Edward Wright, a British mathematician, uh, was sent by the king on a mission to the Azores to do some military planning for uh, some embattlement, etc. But he realized that there are errors in the maps that they have. And so he publishes certain errors in navigation, a book basically full of charts, but there's a little description of what he does. And he hacks Mercator's map. Okay? He actually publishes not just the tables for how to do it, but he publishes his own map. And if you look closely on the top, um, it says, a new map of the world uh, made by Edward Wright, commonly known as Mercator's projection. Right? So, so he's this guy who's going to say, screw this, it's for everybody. And while it's a useful thing and it's kind of a necessary hack, it kind of sets the super visual tone for the rest of you know, for the next 500 years. Because now the map is so dominant and so useful that the Portland chart is basically obsolete, uh, even though its visual context is so critical. Uh, and then we come up to today, where I think there's something new happening that, that, that has a potential to, to kind of swing the balance back. Um, and uh, I'm talking about augmented reality. Um, so if you ever watched this TV show Fringe, um, or you've seen Panic Room in the opening credits, there, there's this tendency to put the text in the image, right? So the text actually looks like they're physical objects, even though they're clearly metadata. Right? They tag the building or the location, with, but they're physically in there. Um, and this emerged out of, of course, where else? DARPA and Armored Defense. So this is BARS, Battlefield Augmented Reality System, where soldiers in the field would have helmets that would show them data of the thing that they're looking at in real time, right? So you have, here in this case, um, for us architects, we'd love to have this for every building, but you can see through the building um, and tell what's, how it's made. Um, or in this case, a conjecture of, don't shoot these guys, shoot these guys, uh, leave these guys alone. Um, and that real-time data is kind of coming to your pocket soon, um, where the Compass DPS and video function on your iPhone, for example, gives you kind of this metadata in real time. So uh, on the right, basically, you can get metro stops in Paris or your local McDonald's. 
um, and it can tell you distances as you're going. And this is being applied to a lot of places. So um, archaeological sites where you have the building reconstructed, um, text, so you can hover over and read something, and if you're not sure what a word is, you can get kind of metadata on it. Uh, and in the most bizarre example I've seen, um, oh. long, long lost loved ones can come to life. Um, but, but I think that what's, what this is doing is shifting a balance of power, representationally speaking, towards a kind of uh, visual metadata that is kind of something that the Portland chart uh, kind of aspired to, but now we're seeing it in real time. And for me, what's interesting about having uh, Lizzie and Trevor here, so uh, Lizzie's map on the left and Trevor's work on the right, is like the kind of straddle the extremes of the most supra-visual possible, like to deal with the mapping itself as a site for, for, for political um, um, expose. And then in Trevor's case, because of the blind spots and the supra-visual data, he actually has to go to the visual um, and, and locate these things. And I think that somewhere in between is this, is this weird world that we're starting to enter where almost anything can be a map. Um, and so, so I'm, I'm curious to kind of now not engage them as kind of these representational opposites yet kindred spirits. But thanks. Next up is uh, Lizzie Mobile. Uh, she's an interdisciplinary artist who works at the intersections between art and cultural geography. She inserts and distributes cartographic projects into public spaces and in publications. She's mapped public parks in Los Angeles, as you saw. Private military contractors in Iraq and Colombia and future territorial disputes in the Arctic, as we also saw. Uh, and she's the co-editor of the uh, Atlas of Radical Cartography. Lizzie Mogul. And uh, by talking about the map as a tool of power, <coughs> excuse me, um, and being a tool, it's in a way almost a neutral thing, so it's available to whoever wields it. And this is the basis of the practice of critical cartography, counter-cartography, and radical cartography, which are sort of interchangeable terms, that what joins them together is an understanding of the map as a political tool, um, but one that can be used as a corrective measure against an imbalance of power. Um, and. Uh, this practice happens in a lot of different scales, functions, and disciplines from art to geography to activism, which I mentioned before. So what I want to talk to you about briefly is the Atlas of Radical Cartography, which is a project that... Can't be um, it's okay, it's, oh, no, it's not stretched, it looks great. Um, which is a project that Lex, Alexis Bagat, who's an artist, an editor, writer, anarchist, sound artist, and I, um, started a couple of years ago, um, and just to give you a really brief um, history of it, is that it started out as a, a project for an anarchist magazine that he was on a, the board of, it was going to be a magazine, and uh, we kind of outgrew it. So it was, uh, it was done through an open call looking for people who were making critical maps, and uh, people who were writing, who could write texts about certain kinds of um, political issues that could also talk about maps. So um, what we were looking for was um, uh, basically, look, uh, as I was saying in, in my talk earlier, is talking about this movement, of this mapping movement that I feel is, is kind of a critical point is right now, like this year and last year. Um, and looking at all of this production that was happening, especially in the art and design world, of maps, but not just maps that were uh, people using maps for kind of aesthetic reasons or metaphorical reasons, but people who are using maps for activist purposes very specifically. And not just in the art world, but in the activist world, you were seeing all of these, uh, seeing a lot of projects of activists, especially this was uh, actually starting maybe in around uh, the time of the Seattle um, anti-globalization protests. Um, seeing these collaborations between activists and artists and designers and making these maps of protest sites. Um, and, uh, and a lot of this uh, also happening in the art world of artists working with maps as political objects. So um, with the Atlas of Radical Cartography, we, um, at the heart of it is the idea that the map is inherently political and there's no way around that. And so these are projects that are unabashedly political and relatively <laughs> lefty. We're, you know, we're not hiding that, that's for sure. Um, so there's a kind of visible politics in these works. 
all of the people who participated in the publication are all activists. It's either integrated into their artistic practice or it's a kind of parallel practice. And uh, that goes along with how we define radical cartography, which is the practice of map making that subverts conventional notions in order to actively promote social change. So the structure of the book uh, was to have 10 maps and 10 essays, and each map and each essay are paired, and each, well, each pair is about a specific political issue, from globalization to garbage to um, migration, um, uh, uh, river, water ecology, the politics of water ecology, um, and so on and so forth. And, um, and each of the 10 maps shows a different kind of visual strategy for just uh, kind of visualizing this kind of information. And uh, the last thing I'll say about it is that it's not just a project about mapping and looking at this, this um, kind of cultural practice that's really prevalent right now, but it's also a project about political education. So even when we present this as an artist talk, or if we're doing a gallery talk, or something like that, we're not only talking about the practice of mapping, but we're also talking about the individual issues. So that's really important. Um, parallel to the book, there's actually three parts to this project. There's the book, there's an exhibition, a traveling exhibition, which has been going around for two years, uh, and is just now starting to hit Europe. Uh, and then a kind of discursive part of it, because for the last two years been, we've been traveling around and doing a lot of talks and workshops and having a lot of conversations with people who are really interested in similar things, so that's been really exciting. Here's just a couple of pictures of the exhibition, and uh, the display is designed by Andreas Muller, who's part of an architecture, which is one of the participants in the project. And it's this kind of nice billboard classroom, uh, uh, you know, radical mapping uh, trade show display which I really like. Um, I'll just go through a couple of the maps really quickly. Uh, this is uh, Every Atlas, and actually I should say that the title of the book is An Atlas because these are only 10 projects out of many, many great projects. And you know, of course, we have no budget. It was all self-published independently. Um, so we can only put in 10 projects. So that's why it's An Atlas. So this was one of many other possible atlases. But Every Atlas, starts with a world, world map, so this is our world map by the artist Ashley Hunt. And it's, it's, it's a map without a geography. There's no geographic um, form in this. It's, it's actually a, a kind of topography of ideas. And um, absolutely impossible to see as a PowerPoint slide, but <laughs> basically uh, you have, um, it's, it's, to be really brief about it, it's, it's about bodies caught up in the processes of globalization and state power. Um, and so you have, for example, up there in this sort of center is like social death, and, which is connected to refugee and um, criminalization, gentrification. Um, there's also foot, there's a lot of uh, text in this. It's the only map in the collection with footnotes. It's, this is the CIA aircraft routes map showing the flights of the paths of extraordinary flights that were uh, extraordinary rendition flights. And I just wanted to show this image because it took us so damn long to get this project together that in the meantime. Uh, this was put up as a public artwork, uh, as a billboard in Los Angeles on, was it Olympic Boulevard, Trevor? Mm -hmm. Something like that. Olympic Wilshire. Wilshire. And, Wilshire. Um, and um, oh, sorry, I should mention this is a collaboration between Trevor and John Emerson, who's an activist graphic designer. Um, we had to twist Trevor's arm to get him to put his information in the book. <laughs> he did it as a favor. Uh, thanks, Trevor. But anyway, I think this is, you know, this kind of information is really interesting what happens when this becomes public and it kind of speaks to the neutrality of this kind of information. And as John was telling me that, a lot of people see this as very critical of the CAA, but he, maybe you told this to John, somebody was like, yeah, go CIA, you're doing your job well. So it's really, you know, maps are tools and they can really be used in, in many kinds of different ways. This is a project by the Institute for Applied Autonomy. Um, which Rich is a part of, and um, uh, it's a project from around 2001 and uh, called The Roots of Least Surveillance, and this is actually a 
a 2D static version of what was originally an online application where you could put in your start point and your end point uh, on a possible, where, in Manhattan, uh, your starting point, your ending point of your, your potential journey and the application would chart out the path of least surveillance for you, so the route that went through the least number of surveillance cameras. Because after 9-11, there was this um, explosion, pardon my pun, of um, surveillance cameras, partly because of paranoia and partly because there was a lot of federal funding for security. Um, so uh, the Institute for Applied Autonomy, the, was it the ACLU, no, the New York Civil Liberties Union and the surveillance camera players, basically went around by hand. This is how data is collected, which is by people, um, and uh, marked down the locations of every surveillance camera in, in lower, mostly lower Manhattan and you know, all over Manhattan, basically. And uh, for the map in the book, they created these kind of archetypal figures of people who might not want to be surveilled from the Muslim American who's already being racially profiled to the anti-globalization protester who's already on a government watch list and doesn't want to be further surveilled to the paranoid guy who thinks everybody's watching him anyway. Uh, this is a project by An Architecture, who is a group of architects and urban designers living mostly in Berlin, um, or working out of Berlin. And uh, they have a, a magazine called An Architecture that comes out, I think, twice a year. And they did an issue about uh, migration and uh, the administration of migration in Europe, which is a very big issue, especially because as the European Union solidifies and expands, so does the kind of borders of Europe. Um, there's something called the Schengen Line. Um, but the borders aren't necessarily just on European soil, they're outside of European soil. So for example, you have uh, European migration administration in uh, West Africa, or in places outside of the European boundaries where migrants are coming from. So the borders of Europe really expand. Um, kind of a complex project looking at the town of Firth, uh, looking at a kind of local uh, point where there's quite a lot of migration infrastructure. So in Firth there are a lot of um, what they call departure centers. And in the middle you can see um, some of these things like laid out, the architecture laid out, and then there's all sorts of other diagrams that talk about the, the flows of migrants and how they're administ and refugees and asylum seekers and how they're administrated. So on the left you have this chart where the big black line shows the number of people coming in and then immediately getting deported. And as you know the lines go down, they go through different kinds of regulations and systems, and there's a lot of loops. People get caught up in the system for like, 10 years sometimes, sometimes more. The white arrows are people entering the country legally. All the way at the top, you see this little black arrow going to the left. That's the number of people who are able to enter the country legally, whose uh, asylum status is granted. This is a project by the artist Pedro Lash called uh, Root Guides Latino Latina America from the Latino Latina America series. And uh, this is a map, but it's not a map. It's, 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 it's not useful as a map. It's not useful for wayfinding. But what it does is uses one of the conventions of, of traditional conventions of mapping, which is by kind of naming something, you claim it. So he's in a way claiming all of the Americas for Latinos and Latinas, which does speak to a certain truth of, of uh, northward migration and demography that um, is sometimes um, obscured. And this project was a collaboration between a number of people who went back and forth um, between the US and Mexican borders, so he gave 20 of these maps two copies each out to um, 20 different people who are crossing the border for different reasons, for work, for commerce, for migration, legal or illegal, and ask them to carry the map on their trip. And so the nature of the trip, um, of the journey, um, the maps kind of gain traces of the journey depending on what the journey was. And then he kept a copy and it's shown in exhibition and then each of the people he worked with got a copy to keep. And he also interviewed all of these individuals, and the installation has, you know, 8 to 16 of these maps in different states of cleanliness or disarray, and then quotes from their, not only their, um, their experience of crossing the border, but also their ideas about Latino, like a Latina identity, and how that's produced from within themselves or by, you know, by uh, governments. This is a project by the Center for Urban Pedagogy, 
Um, I was talking about this in the gallery tour earlier today. This is part of a student project called Garbage Problems, where uh, Cup worked with students, public high school students, to um, do a really deep research into this, the kind of infrastructure of garbage in New York City. And this is a map that they created that shows uh, kind of the players in the system. So on the top, you have the elected officials, the sanitation commission, you've got the commercial waste haulers over there, you've got the activists in different um, low-income neighborhoods uh, where a lot of the waste structure, infrastructure is consolidated. And then you have these, um, these wastebasket icons which have uh, pictures of each of the students and their own personal relationship to garbage as garbage producers and consumers. And so CUP does a lot of projects that are very participatory where the form of the, um, the information takes a form that's somewhat determined by the participants. And I just wanted to end with um, this map by a group called Unayan, who was working in Calcutta. It was a group of basically radical architects, urban planners, working in Calcutta from the late 70s to the mid 90s. And they were, for a while, they were mapping what they called the, um, the unintended uh, city. So there were a lot of refugees in Calcutta as a result of partition and other things at that time. And a lot of these settlements were along the margins of the city, so along canals, railroads, industrial areas. But these were basically invisible settlements. Um, invisible from a geographic perspective and also from a kind of administrative perspective. And so what Anayan was doing was going through the city and right, marking down the um, locations of every single one of these dwellings and then taking these maps to the Department of Planning and other administrative bodies in Calcutta and using them to basically um, kind of solidify these communities administratively and get things like uh, water and power and postal delivery and therefore identity, which uh, you know sometimes you would think informal settlements might want to be hidden from view. There's reasons for that. But in this case, it was very important that these refugees were given an official status and that they had an identity in the eyes of the state, and so became more so became citizens. Um, but Jai Sen, who's one of the founders of the Nayan, uh, questions, he takes a really nice reflexive look at this practice, uh, which he describes in his essay in the book. And at the end, he says, you know, well, we were really mapping these people for them, but not with them. So we were using this very official language of mapping. Um, and it had very good results, but he wonders what would happen if, if, he had, if the mapping had been more, more participatory, and if in the end it would have looked like a conventional map. Thanks. <laughs>